He is known as Dr. Crowdsource. Um, he is a mover and shaker in the world of um, ideation globally. Um, but that aside, I mean, that's his technical capability, I guess, uh, really when it's all said and done, he's just an outstanding, all-round nice guy. Uh, he comes all the way from Paris, and he does speak with an outrageous French accent. <laughs> so listen up, um, enjoy, and uh, please make uh, uh, the CEO of ICA, Francois Pedevy, welcome to Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, one, two, three. Well, fantastic. So I'm really glad to be here with you this morning. Thank you for, for coming. Um, uh, the idea this morning is really to share with you uh, the latest of what we are doing on crowdsourcing and what our clients, uh, how our clients are hacking the way they're doing marketing uh, to reinvent uh, this space. Uh, we believe there's fantastic opportunity in that world to, to first um, reinvent the way we do things, but also have a lot of fun uh, doing it. So I hope I will be able to convey uh, that passion of, uh, of what we do to basically change the way we think about the brands, uh, come up with ideas and actually walk outside, lose the box altogether when we're trying to, to think uh, outside of it. So uh, first of all, a few words about me. So who am I? So uh, this is me at the age of 18. Uh, no, actually, it's a character I worked uh, on, which is called Grey Man. So it's a video game character, and I started as a producer of animated TV series. So I started out of the world of content, uh, computer animation in a company called Ubisoft, who's doing games. Um, and then I moved to the first wave of uh, digital agencies. So at, by the time we were calling that web agencies, if you recall that time, uh, called agency.com, uh, and bringing the brands, the first wave of brands to the internet in the late 90s. So we were doing websites and CD rooms, you know, if you remember that time. Um, and so that's where I met uh, fantastic brands and said I, I really loved uh, to help uh, build brands. Uh, and later on, I went to work for eBay. Uh, and at some point, I was one of the biggest uh, car dealers in France, uh, selling a lot of things, antiques, etc., uh, running the, the, the platform in, in Paris. Um, and all these dots, right, at some point connected when I, I, I met uh, with ICA, and so actually ICA, you'll see, is rooted in a community and a platform, and it connects together creativity and, and brands together. So uh, pretty much connects the dots, and that's why I'm so passionate about uh, this project and, and this company. Uh, since then, so, um, uh, so I just started uh, around here in, uh, in the history of crowdsourcing. So uh, the, the word was coined actually in two or six. Uh, people were doing it before calling that crowdsourcing before then. Um, uh, since then, it's been pretty massive. And now if you, if you look at big brands, I mean, everyone has been or is, is doing crowdsourcing. It's like 90% of the top 100 uh, brands, when you look at, uh, at their activity, they, they are doing or they've been doing crowdsourcing. Uh, so it's become pretty massive. Interestingly, uh, FMCG um, was not the prime mover. So it's been more of a Samsung and the uh, HPs of this world doing it. But actually, FMCG has become the, the biggest user uh, in that category. And we're going to see why. Um, and it's interesting also because FMCG invented marketing, right, uh, uh, 100 years ago. So it's fantastic that now FMCG is, uh, is the leader in that field. Um, and when you zoom into FMCG, what's also very interesting is that, and if you look at the top 15 uh, companies in the space, then the adoption, and this is the number of briefs they, they're running on specific platforms, you can see that this has been growing like 30% a year. So this is something that is getting a very fast adoption in the space. And now a lot of other industries are actually looking at FMCG as a role model on how do you embrace crowdsourcing. So you don't be surprised in the example, you will see a lot of uh, example in the sector uh, because that, that's where uh, a lot of the action is happening, uh, very interestingly. Um, another big change also is that, so if you recall the, the first crowdsourcing campaigns that were of scale, where things like crash the Super Bowl, where they were asking for these videos and say, oh, so the winner gets $1 million and gets aired on the Super Bowl. Uh, so this was the first, I will say, first wave. And crowdsourcing, in a sense, was an event, right? It was like, oh, we are a cool brand. We're crowdsourcing. But if you're Dior, for example, 
maybe you're not going to play that game because it's not consistent with the brand. So this was something that was more contained to a, a smaller box of brands whose uh, asset and whose value was about also embracing people and having people contribute to the brand. But not every brand is like that. Um, and so this started a lot with uh, content, video content production, so asking the crowd to produce video. Uh, and only 30% was about asking for ideas. How should I talk about my brand? What kind of product should I come up with? Uh, so really looking at uh, more of a strategic aspect of it. Um, just in matter of three years, sessions read radically. I mean, when you look at the briefs that are out there now, it's like two thirds of the brief are very much about the ideation space, building the strategy together with the crowd, instead of just expecting the crowd to come up with a final product. Uh, and m most of the examples you're going to see actually examples where the crowd is only contributing some elements of a strategy, but actually it's the strategy is built together between the brand and the professionals and the crowd to actually come up with a final product. So, uh, so this is about the, the, the trends and the evolution of that market. When, when you go to the space of why are those brands looking for IDs, I mean, um, and I got this slide for any category, so, uh, yeah, you can see the sea of sameness, and this same, it's not the fault of, uh, I would say, anyone in particular, it's probably the one, uh, one of the drivers is probably because everyone has been using the same techniques and the same uh, uh, stop gaps, you know, like, of, uh, and committee validation and uh, screening at some point, you end up with the same thing because you're using the same methods, right? Uh, so probably the worst category would be that one, uh, car industry, right? Uh, very tough one. Um, and so what we, doing all this crowdsourcing for more than 10 years now, what we saw at some point was the, the ultimate value was freshness, was the fact that you're inviting people who are actually completely unrelated, marginal, different, crazy, uh, like the Richard Branson's, right? I don't know anything about airlines, but I, get, I, I don't like the experience I'm getting from airlines. I'm going to do my own. And actually, I, I'm going to bring experts to create a new one, but I will start from the experience I'd like to get as a person. And that's very much what we, this kind of fresh eyes, this is what we're trying to bring uh, through the crowd to the brands uh, so that they can really invent, reinvent themselves in the same way that when you travel to another country, you start noticing things that you wouldn't notice on a daily basis, like the plugs are different, uh, or the lights, uh, the traffic lights are different. You start noticing things that in Sydney you don't see anymore because it's like part of the usual routine, right? So uh, how, can, how can you get this kind of new uh, eye to actually reinvent things? Um, so just to show you an example in the car industry, uh, this is, a, a, this is an, uh, an ad for Hyundai. Uh, so it's a master brand campaign. So it's, they don't need to show the car, so it's like it's a bit easier. But this is actually an ad uh, which is about how do you express uh, uh, what is a brilliant experience, right? Uh, so our cars are the, the cars that deliver that fantastic experience. They're kind of struggling to express that creatively. They came to us say, for us, it's business class travel. Uh, but for most people, business class doesn't really mean anything. So how do we express that in, in a way that people could connect with? Um, so we asked the crowd, what is Live Brilliant for you? How do you express that from a visual standpoint? And we got this guy in Italy, close to Milano, who just sent us that visual as part of 100 more that we got. And he said, to me, the first experience is from the inside of a car because I'm, I'm not washing my car every day and that's not the best experience to wash it. It's actually being driven or, or driving it and actually it uh, augments my experience of the world, right? So to be in that car. And from that idea, and it's very much a spark, right? It's not the final campaign, but the brand work with an agency and so together with strategic planners to say actually how do we turn that into a campaign idea uh, and that was then campaign into uh, this creative with the music notes uh, there was this uh, other one with um, um, ice cream cone and actually it also was the root of a TVC so you can see how this spark actually uh, changed your perspective on, on the brand and uh, still being on strategy of live brilliant how do they express creatively that through the eyes of real people, or people who are a bit more real than we, we are when we are in our, our brands and our experts are also. Okay, so you see that. Uh, and it's also very interesting to see that at some point there was this uh, fantasy that maybe the crowd will take over the brands. And actually what you see here, it's about collaboration. It's about doing things together, uh, the experts and 
I mean, people stand in their brand and they, uh, they, they have a role of steering the brand and owning it, but they invite people to help on building the brand and um, executing, in some sense, the strategy of a brand. Um, so the way we found uh, how to do that on ICA, it, and one case of crowdsourcing is very much using a, a, a crowd of what we call creators, because they are not the typical creative, that could be self-trained people, some of them are more professional trained, uh, we also have creative dentists. Uh, so anyone who has a, a knack for creativity is invited, and uh, as long as you can write, uh, draw, uh, paint, or uh, do video, you're, you're, you can welcome. And actually, interestingly, we don't, there is no barrier, right? Anyone can join. Uh, that's uh, something very interesting uh, to the fact that it's radically open and radically non-representative. So we, um, we have now 375,000 people in 160 countries. Those people come up, come on the platform because they have this creative muscle, but they're not using it on a daily basis. So I'm a student and I'm working on like my teacher's project, but I'd like to see real action. Or I'm a creative person in Casablanca and I'm working on local brands, but actually I'd like to see the world and work for Coke and really have like real challenging big ID problems, for example, because I don't do that. Maybe I just do activation on a daily basis. Um, uh, so that, that would be the type of people that we, we attract on the platform. And, and interestingly also, the, the motivation is very um, intrinsic. That means, first of all, it's about when I create, I do what I'm doing best. So it's like uh, I fulfill my destiny. And part of uh, what you're trying to do with them and, and together with you and what, what you do when you invite them into your brands is to give them the opportunity of doing what they do best and express themselves and uh, improve themselves also because they are, it's really changing, right? They are, they are going to be on the front stage and, uh, and show uh, uh, their skills and abilities and they learn out of it. Uh, and the last thing they look for is also is feedback because they understand that there are going to be 100 of them and so not everyone is going to win, but actually they got feedback on what they've done and they can measure themselves against uh, themselves and against others. So it's a very, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, generous approach they have because it's not about being paid and actually you will see it's about competition. So people are not getting paid, uh, only a few of them get actually getting an actual uh, monetary reward. It's about the emotional reward of uh, fulfilling your, your creative destiny. Also very interesting, these are people who see the future, and uh, we've, we've done research um, with, uh, with academics on that. I mean, these are people who have the qualities of lead users. And creative people are people who are ultra sensitive, so they can connect with weak signals that, uh, we'll say, average people don't see. So they have an ability to predict the future in a very efficient way. Uh, and also they have a future consumer, as uh, you can see this distribution. So this is a very interesting uh, target audience uh, to work with. Um, one of the, also the things that is like uh, breaking a lot of the conventions is the fact that um, they can be very relevant to people who are very far away from them uh, because they have the ability as creative people to connect uh, on a human basis uh, to human insights and, and truths. Uh, and so our experience, for example, is that when we run a competition for a super local brand or even unbranded and we ask, like, how do you uh, um, help Chinese women uh, choose a cosmetics, right, uh, or like a fragrance in a store, I mean, the best idea may come from France uh, because we, in the brief, we'll talk about the insights about the Chinese women and people could connect because they say, yeah, my, my sister is like this and I can understand that this is what I'd like to build for her. So 92% actually of, uh, of the people who get the best idea on our platform are not from the target audience, which is, I mean, when you talk to market research people, they're like, what? Uh, but so, and, and this is actually the value of marginality, right? Um, Einstein, he was a clerk, right? Uh, he, was, he was a notary clerk. Uh, so, and David Ogilvy, I think, was a salesman. He was selling cooking stoves and re he reinvented advertising. So, uh, it's very good to have people who are different uh, and bring them into your, your problem. Um, so, very quick um, explanation of, of the basics of how it works. And this is kind of um, what we found to be the unit of. Uh, unleashing creativity, it's, uh, it's very much about this competition model. Uh, and you'll find out in almost all crowdsourcing models is that it starts with a, a very sharp brief um, in terms of what you want to achieve. And that's very, that very you, you can leverage everything you learned about briefing agencies and the same rules apply. But when you got that, all the exercises, how do you 
translate your brief to audiences that are not technical, so they don't know what a ritual is, uh, what a positioning statement is, etc. How do you translate that brief so that you will cross someone uh, at calls and you could explain to that person, okay, I'm running this brand and this is why I'm trying to convey to people. So it's very natural language so that they can connect with your question and most importantly with the consumer challenge we're trying to address. So we never have a brief like, we'd like to grow market share. They don't care about your market share. What they care about is actually, this is the job I want to do for you or for this person, and this is how I'm going to improve their experience or their daily life, or I'm going to explain to them why I'm so great for them, right? That's, so that's the way we turn the challenges so that they really think as consumers. Um, then this is run as a competition, so that's where we invite all these people, and the magic of crowdsourcing is that you have this kind of massively parallel creative thinking happening, so we'll invite five, maybe 500 people read your brief, so you can see the, all the, the hours of thinking that will go into it, maybe 100 people will start doing something, so you're multiplying, or like a demultiplication effect uh, on, the, on the amount of creativity that is uh, sent, and maybe 100 people will finally submit something into the competition, and that's where the action happens is when you start digesting uh, all the stuff, and I, I will go a bit more into that because that's been a lot of the actions in the last two years, is how do you start from raw ID, and like pretty much like out of the oven, and how do you turn this into stuff that you can actually put on TV or do a product with or a campaign. Um, lastly, there is an important aspect, which is that this is a fair system where IP gets transferred in the end, and so people get rewarded for what they transfer to you. So if there's a fantastic tagline, for example, it will be paid for that tagline, so there are winners out of the competition. Um, what we learned in the past year, because we ran more than 1,000 of these, is that zooming out, and you won't be surprised as marketers, so the brief is the absolutely like 95% of the quality of what we get is coming from the quality of the brief. So do you have sharp insights? Do you bring this community to the edge of what you don't know? So do you, do you give them everything that they should know about target consumers, what you stand for, so that we're really inventing new things. So they're, really, they're not reinventing things that you have. When it doesn't work, people tell me, we learned everything we learned in the last five years, but nothing new. That means the brief, we didn't push it to the edge. Uh, then we crowdsource, but uh, always we get the IDs. And then it's all about, once you get these raw IDs, what do you do with them? And that's been a lot of the actions in the, in the recent uh, years where you start with things, this is for product innovation. This is a, um, a raw ID for a, a new drink, right? So people draw it for us and they say this is what's inside, right? Once you get that, and if, imagine you have 100 of these for your new drink design. Then you see clusters, you see the magic of collective intelligence because you have those 100 people who felt from a, a completely different standpoint, so they came up with very different solutions. But out of Brazil, Philippines, uh, France, you see clusters. You see that they all go to naturality theme. They, so you see those themes emerging, and that's already telling you these are the routes in which you could go to drive your innovation. And that's, so these are just examples of these clusters that we see emerging. And that already can orient your strategy, because you say, oh, that route we did it like two years ago, it's not, oh, this is new, this is something we could pursue. And then once you go into the route, then you can start taking those ideas and expanding on them. And so just imagine yourself going into a room, and the room is filled with like oh, 50 ideas of prototypes. Like, uh, and we're talking about MVPs. So it's like small prototypes, minimal five prototypes that you, you can play with, and your team and your colleagues can actually start bouncing on and come up with new ideas and twist and shake and add your own science to it. And actually, in the end of the day, you end up with maybe out of the 50, you end up with five concepts. But the five concepts, you actually raise the floor, right, a lot, because you, you didn't start from the uh, uh, blank sheet or for all the same things that you always come up with in a, in a brainstorm, but actually from completely radically new stuff. And, and, and so you come up with much better ideas in average. We can see that out of the five and the test, when they are tested, those ideas, we get a lot more incremental winners or success than uh, in the average process. So that's, that's uh, and uh, very soon we're going to have a breakfast uh, served. Um, the ultimate value that we found of crowdsourcing out of these last 10 years is very much the freshness. That's what we, we found is the real value of it. Um, 
Um, it's also very fast. That's also another benefit, but that's not the, probably the, the freshness is probably the biggest one. And, and the effectiveness is also something very interesting that you, you start, and I'll go into later on onto the way it changes the agency model a little bit, but instead of uh, doing big things and then looking wherever it works, you start becoming more and more, more agile and do things on the go. And so it becomes much more effective because you can match your investments uh, with actually your progress uh, on the project. So while we are going to serve um, uh, the breakfast, um, uh, we just wanted to spark a conversation about how, how are you, how are you generating ideas right now uh, when you say, okay, we want to come up with a new campaign or we, uh, a new activation. How are your brainstorms going when you do that uh, internally or when you have your partners? Um, so how is it uh, that you're running that? And to stimulate you, we found this funny video yesterday on Fast Company. Uh, just enjoy it. Pretty, it's pretty good. So enjoy the breakfast and I'll be back soon. Uh, I'm going to go on a, a few ones just to show you life examples, real life examples. Uh, and then we'll have Nadim who will show you a real life example and something that, that you've probably seen in the market. Uh, so very broad applications. It can start very much at the front end process. Um, so for example, this is an innovation project we did with Procter & Gamble. Now we can share it. Um, by the time it was unbranded, the community didn't know um, uh, we, for which brand they were working on. And this was this notion that and, and Procter & Gamble came to us and said, actually, we have fantastic technologies. That we, so we can connect your toothbrush to the internet. We can uh, have uh, with 3D sensors. I mean, we have all this stuff, but how do we make solutions that actually are useful to people? Great question, right? So we said, okay, let's just ask the crowd. So we, we just imagine, we, I give you a connected toothbrush, what would you do with it? What kind of service experience would you build with that? So that was the brief. And across a few weeks, we got all these concepts. So everything you see here is an ID from a community member. So for example, that ID is coming from China. And so it's, uh, the person designed the PowerPoint and it's like, it's an app. And it has two modes. Uh, there is a serious mode. So the mode tells your doctor, your dentist, that you've been brushing your teeth one minute 20 in average. So, OK. Uh, and there's a fun mode that is like guitar hero for toothbrush. You see what I mean? So if you, if you do like my first song was like, like this, the music doesn't play. If you do like my other song was doing like this, then music goes berserk. So you have to adjust your pace to the music and actually brush your teeth in the right way. Uh, so you see a theme like gamification emerging, right? You see, you see those mega themes emerging. Um, you have this uh, service which is about um, feedback. So, uh, for example, there is a segment of, I don't know, many percent of people who are achievers. They want to have the best uh, uh, toothbrushing uh, level. So uh, maybe a lot of Brazilians there. Uh, and, and this, for example, this idea is about I get feedback on how well I'm performing, for example, in terms of, and can I, do I forget some teeth or etc. Uh, this is the socialization of the experience. So this is a family competition, so between brothers, who's, who's brushing that is the best way. So it's like most a social network around tooth brushing for the family and uh, with uh, uh, um, also challenges, etc. So when you take all these ideas and you put them on the table, uh, you see five themes emerging. You see uh, content. Two minutes is very long. Can you give me content to make it more entertaining? You see gamifications. Give me a challenge so that tomorrow I do better than yesterday. Um, you see the importance of feedback, etc. And so all these themes actually you can match. Uh, so these are consumer needs and you can match them with technical capabilities. And so what Proctor did is that first they launched an app. So they didn't have a chip yet. So they said, okay, let's launch an app on the iStore and the app is going to listen to the noise of your toothbrush. And actually, they could already do a bit of, um, uh, of duration, so the serious mode and some content. Then they say, OK, now the engineers have come up with a chip, so we have a first connected toothbrush. So the toothbrush connects to Bluetooth to your smartphone and gives you a lot more, because now I can uh, have a much more deeper information about your patterns of using the product. Later on, they launched, for example, recently, the 3D product that tells you uh, which areas of your mouth you've forgotten. So that will be the feedback. So you can see that they had a roadmap for four years of innovation, consumer-led. So, and when they do that, part of the rationale is to say, we build it with people. So our risk to launch this innovation is much lower because actually it comes from the horse mouth. So it's uh, much better chances to succeed than just being all ideas and doing it with people. Um, 
Um, to show you a product on food, so we do a lot of innovation in foods, for example, this is the brief uh, we got with Mexi uh, in Mexico with Doritos. Uh, so it's a love brand there, and it was about how do you reinvent? What is the next wave of Dorito Doritos products? that will deliver something that other chips don't deliver to you, right? Something unique, uh, still keeping the, the triangle DNA, uh, and lots of ideas. One of the ideas was this kind of uh, lucky blue. So this notion of inside the pack, there is one or two chips that make your tongue blue. And so had the gamification experience and the sharing element, right? So you take one, take one, who's going to have the blue tongue so you can create games? And actually that became the Ruleta del Diablo product. So it was a, a, a seasonal product. They launched it and they, they did uh, some promotions. There's a lot of uh, uptake on social media because people were saying, oh, I got my blue tongue, etc." So it has also uh, a lot of tokability elements. And so that was, uh, and this is just one of the products because they have some products who are uh, more R&D intensive to come up with. But uh, this is the type of application of an ID. And probably things that they would not have felt spontaneously uh, about. So, Ruleta del Diablo, I love it. Um, lots of packaging also, uh, things that, how do you trigger conversion on the shell? So, this is a project with, uh, and also the fact that Grady's can come from anywhere. This is a brand in Eastern Europe, and they're uh, one of the leaders in uh, instant coffee uh, there. Um, and in Eastern Europe, you have all these flavors, right? You have like dozens of flavors, so you have a shelf problem because you have to differentiate all, all your line on the shelf and still convey a brand essence in that packaging. So they just had a uh, conversion, a new big idea that was about uh, sensuality in coffee. Um, and so what we asked the community was how do you express that for packaging? Lots of packaging. That idea came from a US designer. Uh, she's a person, she lives in Napa Valley. She's a very strong designer. She's just said, I, I'm stopping to do the, take the road every day on uh, 101, and actually I'm going to work from home. She's, every morning she goes on ICA and other platforms and uh, her own clients, and she just creates uh, things. And so she said, I love this brand, very interesting. She came up with that idea, and that idea was then finalized with uh, professional designers of uh, Don Cafe, this is a product on my, on my table, and this is a product as it's been launched locally. So you can see of the global inspiration, basically, um, uh, there's still some finalization. So for example, the texture is a bit different here. They, they tweaked some stuff, but the essence of a creative idea um, has remained uh, and worked very well in Eastern Europe. Uh, communications is also something uh, that we do a lot. And again, it's very much the power of the ID. And, and you can see how the IDs can then translate into actual material. So this is some work we, we do with Duracell. Uh, Duracell, they're really trying to ladder up from very functional, like, okay, it lasts longer, okay, but why? Actually, it lasts longer, but it helps you connect better to your passions, like music, entertainment, uh, sports, right? So if your batteries, uh, if your devices last longer, you can have a longer run, right? So how do you connect the bunny and Duracell together with sports? So that was the question. Like, create, give me a poster ad, basically that's what we ask, where uh, it empowers you to enjoy your running longer. And so this is, for example, one of the ideas that we got, right? So the bunny on the running treadmill. So that came directly from the community. So this one was handed over to the digital agency, and this is what you could see on Facebook. So, but, so the ID is carried, but then, uh, a bit like uh, cleaned up, put more in the brand framework. Uh, and actually, this is that has been, sorry, uh, been on Facebook, etc., amplified, etc. Uh, so another example, so I had run for three years, two months, 40 days, and 16 hours, so translated into that piece of creative. Uh, infinity performance becomes life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So, you, you build on the ID, on the Spark, and, and there are dozens of uh, these IDs that have been feeding their social uh, media. And actually, it goes beyond social media because that ID, for example, uh, is now you can find it in stores. So this notion of the bunny running with the finish line uh, is now you can find it in stores uh, across Europe. And actually, it also has become their new uh, key visual for the brand. So you can see how just Spark can become uh, much, and much bigger ideas and actually connect very strongly with consumers, right? So, um, and that works from, I got this new product, I don't know how to talk about it, to actually we'd like to find a way of communicating our brand in a new way. That works across those uh, topics. Um, I know that retail is uh, very important um, uh, here, and especially as you have a concentration uh, in terms of uh, retailers. So 
how do you stand off shells? So that, for example, one of the topics we work with um, with uh, Mondelez was about Oreo and Cabaret, and how would you stop people in their journey in the store, right, so that they pick one of your products? Uh, so that was the challenge. So invent a store display, and this is the kind of things that we got. So obviously, if you show this to the guy who has to produce that, they'll say, oh, yeah, it's very expensive to produce. Obviously, you have to tweak that from a design perspective so that it can be cheaper uh, to produce, but the idea of it is often disruptive, and so that moves you and your uh, suppliers out of their comfort zone, so actually they can come up with more disruptive thing and break the clutter uh, in the store. Uh, so pretty nice uh, displays uh, that we got. Um, activations also is something that we uh, need a lot of refreshment uh, along with time, uh, not to see always the same thing. So for example, this is a brief we had from uh, Captain Morgan, and this is about a very clever brief because they, they say, okay, we, we, we uh, there is a, uh, I don't remember if I see a Euro coming. So uh, there is, soccer is going to be everywhere, but we're not an official sponsor. So how can we hijack the, the cup to be in the frame of reference of football, uh, of soccer, without being a sponsor? So that was the brief, basically. Uh, uh, mark the football season, and we got this idea coming, so it was, and it was about the shells, saying, okay, when I, I'm just going to add this ticker, and I'm going to have, a, so I think that's the Euro, because you, you could have your, your favorite club uh, color, so they could customize it by uh, uh, countries or regions, right? And it will just put that as a sticker on the shells, and instantly, so first, it's completely in the DNA of the captain, so we have a brief talked a lot about the spirit of the captain and his fantastic personality. Um, it makes it very relevant from a local perspective because people say, okay, that's my club quarter, so I want it. So it makes the uh, item more attractive and actually has a lot of uh, social media potential because you can then use the mustache. So it's a captain stash uh, concept. And actually this has been produced in Germany, for example, so they, they issued all these mustaches and uh, add social media coverage for it, etc. So uh, you can see how this like, fresh thinking can bring new types of activations and very important you're not in a price promotion, uh, you're really building the brand out of your activation, which is uh, really great. Uh, so some examples, this is another one, so soccer uh, is, a, is a nice uh, pretext to do that, so this is a, a, a brief to really reinvent uh, the way Lays connect with uh, football across all the, all the occasions. Um, and that can be pack, events, uh, all channels, all touch points. Um, also in terms of um, uh, Health also this works very well. So this is this was a project with Meta Museal to to really find new ways of connecting and also connect with people in places where we would not expect the brand naturally. So it was a lot about think about your consumer journey where you go on a day. Where would you need to stumble on this brand? And then you think about this place and you tell me what the brand could do to catch your eye and actually become part of your of your frame uh, of a day. Um, also, the, the last mile or the last meter, uh, this is a very interesting brief. So obviously, I, I can show you results of these ones because they are, so just to show you the type of questions we have. Uh, it's a question about like, the, the Coke and McDonald's partnership, and it's very much, how do we make sure that every time someone goes into a McDonald's, they get a drink? Uh, and what do we change in the store journey? Uh, what do we change in the, know, even the promotions or like uh, the, the displays to make sure that they think about it? And that could be, very simple things, like a post-it note, or that could be uh, something very digital. So we, you could have all this kind of frame of, uh, of potential ideas to do that. Um, something that we, uh, we love doing also, and uh, our community loves, is about coming up with the idea to be the next director of a TV campaign or for a digital movie. So here what we ask people is to say, write a script for or a storyboard for the next TVC or brand X. So we educate them a lot. So this is a, a very familiar brand here. Uh, for the rest of the world, it's uh, not known. So the, the brief here, actually this brief was about bouncing on a very successful campaign and doing the, the follow-up of a campaign to, to rejuvenate the campaign. Uh, so I guess you've seen the campaigns, it's like don't bring anything and people bring crazy things. So I said, to, how do you put that in the context of uh, Christmas barbecues? When Matt sent me the brief, Christmas barbecue, wait, wait, okay, so now I get it. Uh, and, and so yeah, it was, and so very uh, sharp brief, right? So take the previous ad and give us your reinterpretation of that ad in the context of Australian summer barbecues for Christmas and we got a lot of ideas, prioritize them, 
this was fantastic ID coming from the UK, so 92%. So UK copywriter says, this is my ID, spot on, debrief with clients. So very agile process because we just bounce ideas together with the client and, and, uh, with the, client and the creative director uh, to have a, a professional look assessment on the ID. And this is so the- So you're this afternoon, great. Oh, and it's just a small party, so don't bring a thing. Sweet, that makes it easy. We just, uh, we should definitely bring something. What are we gonna bring? They're reindeer. <laughs> it's mashed potato. <laughs> Mistletoe. Hey? No. Okay. You shouldn't have. Oh, yes, we should. Cadbury favourites. What to bring when you're told not to bring a thing. So interesting if this type of approach also is very agile production because uh, uh, once we uh, curated the ID, the brand worked with a, a local production company and uh, so it's been pretty scrappy production. I think it was one day shooting, but actually so it's a, it's a, a way of um, unbundling uh, the process, right, in some way and you act your way through your ad um, and that's very efficient in terms of timing and budget, obviously. So obviously that challenges the agency model, right? So how, what do we do uh, with agency of record, etc.? And uh, you'll see our view is very much that this is about collaboration and not uh, that much competition and crowdsourcing is a catalyst to the process because if you look at the traditional process, it's very iterative. So you have to invest a lot of money at every stage, right? And you kind of uh, progress your way. So say, okay, well, we believe in these two ideas. Okay, pick one, test, okay, not perfect. And then, and you iterate and you spend money and doing that time competition is doing all the stuff. Um, and uh, so it's, it's uh, it, and it can last I mean, months, uh, sometimes years for, uh, I've heard for some brands. So what crowdsourcing does, it like, it shortcuts that process because you collapse that stage uh, because you put all, and provided you get a good brief um, and that's a very important aspect with good insight then you, you put all the ideas on the table at once and you curate you navigate your way through these ideas and, and Nadim is going to share it with you uh, how he did uh, in the real scale uh, and then once you, you refine and actually you're you're really confident on the one ideas and actually you can test them etc uh, then you can launch and, and what we see in average is that probably the results of will be 20 to 30 percent more efficient because they are just simply out of mathematics. You've put much more creative brains on it, um, and you know, it's, it's a, as one of my clients is saying, is statistic, statistically much better way to source creativity, right? Um, just uh, out of it, and also you're doing that with people who have passion to doing it, and we're not, I will say kind of forced because they, they, like, they have to go at 9 a.m. and work on this brand, they choose to work for the brand, which is also a, a very interesting, that, where you need to have people who are really professionals in when you do this because that's where you need to be really much in the frame and get things right. So interestingly, what we've seen is that this is, um, and crowdsourcing is uh, becoming a catalyst of a, a very wide ecosystem of people uh, who are actually using this tool to actually come up with uh, new processes, new creative process, new products. So people in the market research space, for example, for innovation, uh, where they're building end-to-end. -end. So for example, uh, Kanta has launched uh, something called Seven, which is an end-to-end -end process that gives you innovation concepts in seven days using ICA in the weekend. So we, they, get, they draft a brief on the first day, then on the weekend, the community gets 50 ideas, and then on Monday, people are workshop, and on the first day, you get concepts validated. That's just an example. So this is the type of things we're building on the creative space. Uh, you'll see example with Unruly. Uh, we have people in the consulting space, for example, looking at what is the future of banking, and can we crowdsource the vision of uh, how could a bank be as easy to use as Amazon, for example, or insurance. Um, and also you have like new types of agencies. So these, these crazy guys here have an agency in Denmark, Denmark. They created an agency with six people. So they all have very strong background in agency world. Uh, the creative director is a guy who did I'm a Barbie girl, if you remember. So it's like very, very strong creative guy. And like, there are six people in the agency and they don't have a creative team. They, the creative is a crowd. What they do is they, they are very strong in strategy. So what how do we drive a brand and planning and managing production execution with an ecosystem? And they're like kicking us in, uh, in uh, Denmark right now. So it enables new models and actually that's part of uh, a very exciting thing is that we, we all get to invent these new models together and it's all about co-creating these models uh, to, to come up with the, the next way of doing marketing and innovation. So just to show you a last example and that one is very interesting because it shows 
um, within PNG was a culture of working with uh, legacy agencies and AORs for like, like 25 years for some case. How they came up with this chemistry of having a crowd collaborate with the agency, coming up with a real uh, integrated 360 campaign in Japan uh, last year. Um, so you're gonna see uh, what the client feels about it. Young people had a certain perception towards Pantene, which was, it's the brand that my mother used. The challenge was to make the new Pantene summer treatment the must-have beauty product for the summer and make Pantene relevant for young girls in Japan. Summertime in Japan is the peak consumption period for hair care products. This was an opportunity for Pantene to partner with Ica to help disrupt the category for young girls. The ICA contest generated 280 entries from over 42 countries. Four clear themes emerged from the multitude of entries. This output was further taken to a co-creation workshop between the creative agency, PNG and ICA to shortlist and improve the best ideas for execution. And the winner was... We picked up an idea that was uh, around summer hair rescue and it was the, the visual that we used to talk about it was most Baywatch for your hair. The winning entry inspired the agency to develop the campaign idea around rescue your hair in summer. A TVC was developed based on the idea of a face-off between a lifeguard whose hair is as shiny and healthy as a high school girl. The co-creation workshop also helped to make the ideas more holistic, taking it across touch points. A beach-like setting was created in central Tokyo, where rescue lifeguards analyzed girls' hair and gave out samples. Social media and PR helped create further reach and talkability. The results? Very, very good results, and um, both in terms of sales and equity. Number one in treatment category. 77% of promo pack buyers were new trial, 109 sales index, 203% exposure versus target. I'd definitely work with Ica again. The use of visual metaphors to tell our ideas were really fresh ways of thinking um, that made us come up with, um, with a holistic plan that was much more interesting and relevant to young consumers in Japan. Here again, the idea was coming from Indonesia to convince uh, Japanese girls. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a nice example. Um, um, Matt, Phil, and I were also marketers. So when, when we knew we were going to organize this event, we felt, OK, so what are we, how do we position that event, right? So, so and just to show you, um, so we, we take our own med medicine. Uh, we say, OK, let's ask the crowd, right? So we, we put a brief on the platform. I say, uh, how do you convey this notion that if you are r running a brand, I mean, the fresh ideas is the essence. Right? It's more important than ever. So we ask the crowd, we run our own contest. So we, and you can see it works on like, uh, even like less known brands like Ica. And we got this idea. See? So yeah, so it's also, yeah, so. So that's coming from the crowd. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, we'll take questions uh, in the end, uh, if you're okay with that, um, after Nadim's presentation. And so, um, yeah, no, we know Nadim is going to show you in action and uh, in market uh, a real life example.